All the movie was designed for this strong vertigo, feeling of vertigo with landscapes. But then an, an insane intimacy with character. The way we shot the movie, the way we, I approached uh, depth of field, the way I approached uh, rhythm in the editing, the way we designed the sound and the music. I was a teenager that deeply loved reading books. I was reading a lot, and I was always looking for new material. I saw that very beautiful book cover about a man with blue eyes, and I um, dive into the book and I devour it. I was saying to myself, one day, I would love to bring this to the screen. I think that when you adapt, you need total freedom, and definitely the movie is my take on the book. I really um, focus on the main character, which is Paul Atreides, of course, but still, I had to make precise choices in order to bring the story to, to the screen, and one of them was to focus on, on the female characters. And for the people who don't know the, the story, there's like a female congregation of, of sisterhood, a sisterhood of the Bene Gesserit, who are controlling all the politics from the shadows, you know, and they are like masters that have full control over their bodies and that can control the minds of, of, of other people with their voice. Stop! Cut the rope! I try to put that up front in this uh, uh, adaptation. Leave us! You must do everything the mother mother tells you. You dismissed my mother in her own house. Come here. Kneel. Here, several things are happening. The Bene Gesserit can use something called the voice in order to control the other human's will and go into the subconscious and ask him to cross the room and kneel in front of her. How dare you use the voice on me? I thought at the beginning that it could look silly if Timothée had to cross the room like a zombie. And it came into my mind to embrace right away from the beginning the point of view of the character and to fall into a very short period of time in some kind of micro coma. To create that feeling, we thought to make very strong dollies, camera movement, and the same time switching off the lights of the room. Come here, kneel. And also, as we are moving the camera, we are not touching the focus. So it means that the, the characters are diving into the out of focus zone in order to create that feeling of uh, disorientation and vertigo. You dismissed my mother in her own house. Come here, kneel. When we, uh, the cinematographer, of Dune cinematographer, Greg Fraser and I started to brainstorm about the movie, we knew that at the end of the day, it's a character that will be in contact with a new planet, a new landscape, and the more he will travel into this landscape, the more the journey will become introspective. The idea of massive wide shots that will put back uh, humanity into their place, into the ecosystem, meaning that they are ants on the surface of a planet. And I, I wanted to be very close to Paul, so we are always in the extreme. Close-ups and uh, wide shots, there's not a lot of medium shots in the movie. It was a combination of trying to just ride the edge of going small figures in big environments and intimacy. The large sensor on the LF allows you to use a mid-lens, yet be reasonably close to your actors. To me, the, the, the proximity of the camera is integral. So there are times with Timothy where he's experiencing spice episodes that we're able to get nice and close to him to be that intimate. There's spice in the tent. Help me, please.
Please. With Denny's films, it gives me a chance to play with something, and it's very hard to find the word for this, but I would call it brain stemmy images. And they're all very sensory, incredibly sensory. Whether it's a foot on the sand for the first time, or whether it's a hand in water. Film is rich in these sensory moments. What were your choices in terms of what to build? Because obviously there's a huge visual effects component. There's all kinds of enhancements to the environment. And I think beautifully, beautifully blended. What were the biggest sets that you built? There are two, there's like the palace, the, the residency. The, we built like a massive corridor with so maybe 30 feet high. And I wanted to shoot the landing, mm. so we built a tarmac in Hungary, like the size of two football fields, to create a scale, to have the distance with the extra, to have the proper scope. We were doing a sci-fi, but without all of the sci-fi gag. Like, we, there were no chrome robots walking around. There was no computers in this world. It's not how this world works. So a lot of the design sort of looks a little bit ancient and brutalist and simple. The feeling of it is closer to a, a period movie more than a, to a sci-fi. There's something historical, and we try to protect that, that the quality in the costume design and the, some elements of the set design and definitely in, in, the, in the props too. It was important for me to, to keep roots into our reality. Well, and I think one of the, the most spectacular locations that is Wadi Rum in, in Jordan, which um, some of you may know from Lawrence of Arabia. It just feels so close to the, the description of the book. But the thing is that Jordan has a very special vibe. It's very impressive how every 25 miles you have a totally different landscape. And it's like uh, there's something about the light here, there's something about the soul of the country that uh, I think we can capture with a camera that I, I, can't, uh, I don't find that same kind of emotion anywhere else. There's a place where uh, Paul and Jessica meets finally the Fremen. It's exactly the description. It's like that kind of horseshoe dead end in the rocks. It was like a very inspiring for me to, to find those locations that felt so, so close to the spirit of the book. And was it a difficult film to edit? I mean, in terms of getting all of this complexity, it feels like there must have been significant challenges in terms of clarity, in particular. Yeah. Editing is a very important part of the filmmaking process for me. It's at a time where you rewrite the movie in some ways. With Denny, a lot of the time, we will review a scene without any audio at all. We're trying to kind of make it work like a silent movie. When you turn the sound off, you become hyper aware of people's eyes. And I feel like that's a serious part of what we do, is driving the cut by the expression in the eyes. Dune, if nothing else, is for me one massive work of rhythm. It's got an interesting rhythm, this film, because it starts actually quite gently and builds up your interest in the characters and then it's accelerative. One of the things which was incredibly important for us was that the strength, the underlying strength, the foundation of this movie was the female character, so the female voice.
it's by far my most musical movie. Huh? It's like a never-ending score because I was feeling that it needed that kind of operatic feeling. Desert power. This is only the beginning. bring to life uh, uh, something that has been so close to your heart and, and your and soul and, and that you dream for 40 years. Frankly, it brings tears in my eyes because it's the first time that this part of myself was able to express. It's like a, a freedom to finally be honest <laughs> that I, I, I deeply love. If you were saying me, someone was coming inside the studio saying, okay, that's enough. No more movies for you. You did it and, it, and it, cinema is over. My first feeling would be gratitude <laughs> because I will say that was a, a, a ride. I, 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 was, I feel so blessed that I had the chance to, at least one time in my life, went into that zone. Cut. And technically, the problem is that uh, I, I painted myself in a corner. I did half of it. I did half of, of a big movie. I did Dune part one, and I need to do the second part now. <laughs> yeah. So it's done, finally. <laughs> 